On a dark winter night in January 2023, 2,000 excited ticket holders crowded into an airport in the southwest of England to watch the first commercial satellite launch from UK soil. So there she goes, carrying with her not just a 400 kilogram rocket, but the hopes of the British space industry too. But the excitement quickly turned to dismay as Virgin Orbit announced that a technical problem had prevented the aircraft launch rocket from reaching space leaving the nine precious satellites it carried to crash into the Atlantic Ocean. When that second stage news came through that it had failed, it was heartbreaking. Me, my family and all of the team that had come were all crying. The expectation was that everything was going to work. So when things did fail and the launcher failed to achieve orbit, um, I think people were caught by surprise. After the failure of Virgin Orbit's launch, many were wondering whether the fledgling UK space sector is similarly doomed. Despite being backed by billionaire Richard Branson, Virgin Orbit suspended operations and filed for bankruptcy protection months later. But what effect did this high-profile failure have on the UK space industry? We spoke to several startups busy getting their projects ready for liftoff. The original space race played out during the Cold War as the United States and the Soviet Union competed for 30 years to be first to reach a series of milestones. In 1962, the UK became the third country to operate a satellite. But from the mid-1970s, tensions between the US and the USSR began to ease, paving the way for joint projects. While crewed missions continued, complex satellites to allow for improved navigation, communication systems and weather forecasting were being manufactured. But even as commercial uses developed, satellite launches usually still relied on state-backed organisations in the US, USSR, Europe and China. When I was a boy, satellites were the size of a small car. Today, a satellite's the size of a, a cup of coffee. So ergo, they're cheaper and easier to launch. And satellite technology is used in everything from ATMs to smart fridges to GPSs, etc. So it is this new industrial revolution. To have your own satellite orbiting the Earth is to be part of an elite but ever-widening group. As of October 2023, there are around 12,000 space objects in orbit registered with the United Nations, with Starlink, backed by billionaire Elon Musk, responsible for well over a third of these. Small communication satellites like Starlink's constellations of broadband internet devices have driven the dramatic increase as people look to stay connected whilst on the move, even in remote areas. Amazon also has plans to launch thousands of small satellites to create a competing system. Between 1965, at the height of the space race, and 2012, the average number of objects launched into space remained stable at around 130 per year. But the last decade has seen a huge uptick in launches, the vast majority being for satellites. And this is a trend which shows no sign of slowing. By the time we get to 2030, it could be as many as 100,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. And these low orbiting satellites have got to get up somehow. Saxavord Spaceport CEO Frank Strang hopes this former Air Force base at the very northern tip of the Shetland Islands will become the site of the first successful orbital rocket launch from UK soil in 2024. As you can see, we're on a very remote island and we were looking for a key to regenerate the site. We've finished our first launch pad. We're very close to getting a spaceport license, so we're moving really quickly. Objects have successfully been launched into space from planes, submarines and from 28 ground sites around the world. Cape Canaveral in Florida holds the record with over 5,000 satellites sent into space since 1958. In the UK there are plans for at least seven launch sites, including the scene of Virgin Orbit's failure in Cornwall and Space Hub Sutherland, 200 miles south of Saxevoord. Saxevoord's northerly position means that rockets can safely be launched in a wide range of directions without flying over towns or cities. These include trajectories which are ideal for satellites taking images of sections of the Earth's surface at the same time each day, useful for surveillance, environmental monitoring and weather observation. The UK government's aim is for the country to be the leading destination for commercial small satellite launches in Europe by 2030. But building a spaceport from scratch doesn't come cheap. We've spent the best part of 24 million to date. Um, by the time we finish the three launch pads, complete the public road improvements, build a launch control centre, um, tidy up the accommodation, you're going to be close to 45 to 46 million. 
Frank and his team secured investment from their own billionaire backer, Danish-born Anders Hol Poulsen. Industry and the government didn't believe that we existed or we were serious. So trying to persuade investors to invest in us was difficult. You know, so we used our own money um, and went down a few rabbit holes and eventually, bit by bit, people started to believe and, and we got to the point where we are now, where we are very well financed. So what's driving the race to build launch sites? During the Cold War, the American space industry was under the control of the federal government. One giant leap for mankind. But after Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon, NASA's budget was cut amid a loss of political support for space exploration. When NASA pulled back, private companies stepped in. Today, the new marketplace for space launches is dominated by SpaceX, one of Elon Musk's many firms. The company's reusable rockets help to lower the cost of each launch and capture a large share of the market in the process. Between 2013 and 2022, the cost of getting things into space fell by a third. The US's share of commercial launches has gone from zero to 40% over the same period. Amazon founder and fellow US-based billionaire Jeff Bezos is also getting in on the act with Blue Origin, which also plans to launch satellites using reusable rockets. Nearly three quarters of all space-related spending is invested in developing, launching and operating spacecraft, satellites, subsystems and their complex payloads. And a range of UK-based companies, including Saxavord, are looking to get a slice of this increasingly accessible $280 billion industry, which is currently worth more than $20 billion per year to the UK economy and employs nearly 50,000 people locally. In fact, nearly a fifth of the country's GDP, worth $450 billion, is underpinned by global satellite services. In charge of keeping the construction project at Saxavord on track, is Elizabeth Johnson, whose grandfather farmed the land on which she's now building launch pedestals that rockets will take off from. We're looking over my grandfather's land up at the top there. I think he would have been very pleased with the activity on this site. Although the weather was ideal for building during our visit, the Shetland Islands are known for their windy climate and short winter days, providing additional challenges to any construction project. At the moment, we're overlooking uh, the foundations for our first hangar, Hangar A. The foundations alone are probably a million pounds worth. After being shipped up to Saxavord, launch vehicles will be assembled in a clean room inside this high-tech building before being loaded with satellites. It's going to be a, a tight time scale to get everything done in the summer months that we need here. Despite the substantial investment, launches will retain some risk. Something like 70% of first launches are going to fail. So prepare for that, but learn from the lessons. 650 miles south, in the capital city of Wales, satellite-making startup Spaceforge is all too aware of the challenges involved in a launch. Their first satellite, Forge Star Zero, was lost in the failure of Virgin Orbit's January 2023 mission. With the way that that launch failed, we almost very nearly did get there. We did get to space. I think in the end it got to about 284 kilometers before that second stage failure happened. We gave the team a, a day off just to come to terms with all of that work being lost. And then we got down and got set and got ready and started building our next mission. CEO Joshua Weston and his team are now hard at work building a new, much larger prototype, which they hope will prove that their technology works. Because of the huge demand for launch slots, Spaceforge had actually booked the scheduled departure for this second satellite even before their initial attempt to launch with Virgin Orbit. We booked this particular launch uh, around 24 months in advance. Well, you can get some incredibly late notice, a couple of months out, but the price goes up significantly, just like it does when you're trying to book a flight. So as Spaceforge, we we've taken the decision to book flights really far in advance. Spaceforge is designing its satellites to operate like tiny factories in space, making use of the permanent vacuum and lower apparent gravity experienced by objects in orbit. They plan to lease the satellite's capacity to manufacturers to create materials which are difficult or impossible to make on Earth, such as high-quality semiconductors, metal alloys and exotic pharmaceuticals. The entire device will then be brought back from orbit and recovered, so the satellite can be reconditioned and reused. The reason why we do this in space is because it is so much fundamentally better for the materials that we can create and the way that they get used. 
There's also an environmental benefit. While rocket launches may cause pollution, the overall carbon emissions from manufacturing semiconductors in space will be lower than if they had been made on Earth. So for every kilogram of CO2 we create, we can actually prevent between 15 and 80 tonnes of CO2 being emitted. Weston and his team are backed by investors from the UK, US and Germany, but don't have a billionaire on board just yet. If anything, I point to a billionaire for a launch failure. We have not been shy from trying to do things on a shoestring, which is a rare thing you hear in a space company. The idea of making satellites smaller and less expensive to launch by using cheaper, less complex components isn't entirely new. Spun out of the University of Surrey in the 1980s, Surrey Satellite Technology now has four decades of experience in building satellites in the UK and is owned by European aerospace giant Airbus. So I think it's changed quite a lot, particularly in the, in the last sort of 10 years, really coming along from the, the, the change in the, the mobile phone in this industry and how uh, consumer electronics has changed and that driven the miniaturisation of a lot of electronic parts. But inexpensive is still a relative term, as SSTL's Chief Technology Officer Andrew Hazelhurst explains. Generally speaking, you're looking at something like five to $20 million. Obviously, once we launch it, it goes into outer space and then we can't get it back. So it's not like the car where you service it over time, change your oil, change the wheels, etc. We have to make sure it's right from, from the beginning. But even the most carefully manufactured satellites wear out eventually. With an ever-increasing number of objects occupying a few key orbital paths, regulators and industry players have begun to put an emphasis on making sure these don't become too congested. What we like to do at the end of the, end of the mission is bring the spacecraft down into the atmosphere so it naturally will burn up within the atmosphere uh, and won't have any debris uh, making its way back here to, to Earth. Another, much trickier option is to bring the satellite back to Earth intact. Imagine if every time you, you got on a flight, you threw the plane away when it landed. It, it wouldn't make any sense. Well, now imagine you throw the factory away, that every time it made a plane, you got rid of that too. Spaceforge is one of a number of companies working on technologies which will allow satellites to be diverted from their orbital path and then slow down enough as they enter the atmosphere that they can be recovered in one piece and either recycled or reconditioned for repeated use. We go from about 50,000 miles an hour down to about 20 miles an hour uh, in under an hour. So it's pretty intense braking. That then allows us to float all the way from space down to the ground. The success of Spaceforge and Saxaford's projects is by no means guaranteed, but they hope to play a part in the UK's space industry, stepping out of the shadow cast by Virgin Orbit's failure. We have a slight lead um, in the market in Europe. Um, we need to move quickly. In America, rocket launch is basically boring because they happen all the time. And I don't think the UK has had, a, has had an engineering success to shout about for a long time.